Well, it's lovely to be back and be able to speak to you again, and thank you for that. <coughs> so, what I want to speak to you about is about the theme of the conference, and Mary as the model of authentic accompaniment. So, um, just to really give you a sense, it's a very simple talk in this sense. I'm not trying to get across many things. The first one is, Mary is the absolute key person to whom we need to refer in the Christian life as the one who will always accompany us. That's, that's kind of message number one. So, how she accompanies us. Secondly then, as a catechist, as somebody in ministry, we will learn from her everything we need to know about the accompaniment of other people. And I just want to try and get some of those lessons out. And I want to, I'm just going to focus on one very short passage. Um, you know, there was a verse we put underneath the title, and Mary remained with her, which is from the visitation. So it's, a, it's a quite an interesting, the visitation begins with a Mary went forth in haste. So it's got a kind of whole sense of the spring in the step, a movement and going the journey and she's very anxious to join Elizabeth. And then Mary remains with her is the final verse of that, of that sequence. So what she's really about in terms of moving fast is precisely so that she can remain with her. Yeah, so I just want to look at that as well. Today, exactly this day last year was the day I was whisked off in a helicopter. So this is, it was on Our Lady of Mount Carmel. If there's one message, if you like, I want to give, it is Our Lady's faithfulness. Our Lady's utter faithfulness. So I was taken in the helicopter on the Feast of Mount Carmel my operation was on the Assumption of Our Lady, and then I left the hospital on the Queenship of Our Lady. <laughs> and talk about Our Lady accompanies you. She is the utterly faithful person who we can look to all the time in our lives. So that's, if you like, that's the one message I want you to get, Mary's faithfulness to us. And therefore, how she's faithful to every other person we ever give ministry to, and how we can rely upon her and help other people to do so. And let's look at how she does that. I'll just start with a story about accompaniment from my own life, just so that you can, in a way, you start learning about this very, very early on as a fundamental human reality. So in the early years of Catherine and my marriage, our first child is called Caris. And I'd say between, well, you know the first children are sent to train their parents. <laughs> Essentially, they are sent as the sort of the advanced elite core to get their parents sorted so that they can then bring up children properly. So, Caris, between probably the ages of, I'm trying to work out when it was, but let's say six months to two years, she had the most amazing training regime she put us through which was basically, how do you find time ever to sleep? <laughs> was, that, was, that was the main thing she wanted to teach us. One thing, Karis was a very, very friendly, gregarious, sunny disposition of a child. And as long as you were with her and holding her, she was absolutely wonderful and she would smile at you and smile at everybody else, she'd be no bother. As soon as she thought there was any sense of being left at all by you, it was tears, abandonment, frustration, you know, my parents have left me forever, was the kind of the theme. <laughs> and so every single evening, the training was how to get Karis to go to sleep so we could leave her for a short period. So you'd carry her around and you'd sing to her and she'd begin to doze, and she'd look up at you with beautiful eyes, and then she'd close her eyes, and then you would slowly decide it was probably safe to try to put her down. If she felt herself leaving your body at all, <laughs> I would say she was like an angel, in the sense that, you know, they are wide-eyed before the throne of God. So, 
Karis was wide-eyed immediately. Something's happening. She became angel mode. So you had to lean over gently into strange contortions, never letting any gap get between your body and hers. Because if she felt that, she'd immediately wake up and smile at you. And if you then continued it, fear, trauma, abandonment, tears, and you'd just put her back, and I wasn't really doing anything, and you'd just carry on singing to her. And then eventually, maybe after about an hour, you'd try to put her into her bed, and you'd try and make the mattress feel like your hand <laughs> by pressing down into the mattress so that it was indistinguishable from your hand. And then you'd take the one out very quickly, and then you'd slowly push down and take the other out quickly, and then you'd stand there, because if you moved, she'd wake up. So you'd stand there, maybe for a minute, not breathing, and then you'd slowly try to retreat. And then she woke up. With a, and she smiled at you, and if you moved, it was tears and abandonment. So this, this was, of course, it was a tough training regime. The one way we found we could ever get Karis to sleep, which she absolutely loved, was going for a car ride. She really loved just the sense of movement of being in a car. So after a while, Catherine and I knew, nine o'clock, car time. <coughs> So you take her out, you put her in a car seat, and off you'd go. You'd drive, you'd use up a lot of gas, and you would basically see places you'd never seen before, <laughs> while she slowly was chirpy in the back, and then it got quieter and quieter, until eventually she fell asleep. And that really worked. It just is extremely expensive. <laughs> so we, we did that. We did that, as I say, felt like for months and months, you know, just thinking, when will this ever end? I remember one night I was out with her, she strapped in the car seat behind, and I was just driving and, you know, minding my own business, and it was quite late at night, sort of about half ten at night, eleven o'clock, suddenly, out of nowhere, a car just pulled out of a side road, almost went into the side of me, and then just shot off into the distance. I'm extremely mild-mannered. So I didn't say anything. I just accelerated. And I just, in my mind, I just thought, the man will have to die. <laughs> That's all I thought. I can remember just thinking, it's, it has to be death. Because, I mean, you know, he could have killed Karis. It could have, anyway, he was a lunatic on the road. And... I now became law and order. I was going to track him down. He would not get away tonight, and that was it. So my fury was just expressed in acceleration. We were just going faster and faster through these streets for quite a while, taking corners fast. And anyway, we were just going on. And then this little voice in the back of the car spoke to me. And he just said this. He didn't mean to, Daddy. Anyway, at that moment, it was as though the spell broke. Suddenly, I don't know what it was about how she said it, what he said, suddenly, I was at the foot of the cross. Suddenly, I was there with Christ saying, Father, forgive them. Let them just go. It was for me just, okay, just let him go off into the darkness, let him go, don't pursue him with your law and order, don't try and track him down and smash him off the road, just let him go. And that was just that little voice. And I was, I, I was thinking of that because it affected me a lot at the time because I am prone to a little bit of wordless acceleration fury in my life. And as I reflected on that, I thought, do you know Karis, what she did? She accompanied me. In the funniest, a bit of training for me. Because she was there, strapped into her seat. She was there, she was going to stay with me. That's the first point about accompaniment. You stay with the person. Second thing was, she kept me safe. 
And you know, when you accompany anybody in the Christian life, and when Mary accompanies us in the Christian life, she basically is trying to keep us safe. She's trying to protect us. And Caris did that just by that little phrase. Thirdly, third thing she did, she led me to Christ. Whatever she said and how she said it, I was there with Christ. And that's the third thing we have to do in accompaniment. We have to stay with people, keep them safe, lead them to Christ. And the fourth thing she did really was she reminded me of God's providence, that God uses his creatures to look after us, and that God himself never leaves us and always accompanies us. And Our Lady is the creature he's given to do that for us in our life. And she reminded me of that as well. So that was a little model for us. And as I thought about this, and I thought about the importance of Our Lady, and I have come to this late in my life, one of the low points in our marriage, which I caused, was I can remember, because I'm a convert from being a Baptist, I can remember the time early in our marriage when I was sitting down, looking at our mantelpiece, and there was a statue of Our Lady there on the mantelpiece, and I thought, it's got to go. And I can remember taking it off. So I've come a long way from thinking that Our Lady was the distraction to Christ to Our Lady as the route to Christ. That's been a big, long journey. And amazing, her faithfulness in taking care of somebody like me who took her statue off, the mantelpiece, is pretty amazing. Let me give you an image for Our Lady. I'm hoping to let you stay with one image from this talk. And it's one I found in um, one of the medieval books about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. I don't know how many of you are King Arthur fans. Yep, oh, that's good. Okay, so this is, this, is, um, this is one of the works. It's called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Now, in the early stories about King Arthur, the key knight isn't Sir Lancelot of the Lake. He later on becomes the key knight. It's always Sir Gawain. And he is the one who represents what it is to be Christian, what it is to be a Christian man, what it is to be a knight for Christ. And this book really is how do you become the man, the chivalrous man for Christ. And there's a passage in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight where it describes him receiving his shield for his quest. Now the shield with the emblem on the shield represents his life. It's, this is what your life is for. And it describes the shield in beautiful detail. First of all, it's a five-pointed star. Now, I have to say something about this because it's a really important point for us. That has been taken over as an occult symbol and it's a Christian symbol. And it is the symbol Sir Gawain uses as the point on his shield. So sometimes you have to reclaim from culture a Christian meaning to something that's been lost. It is not an occult symbol in itself. It is a Christian one. And the book goes on to describe what these five points are. First of all, it says, it's because you use your five fingers and your hands for Christ in every way. And secondly, it represents the five senses, and each of your senses must be purified for Christ so that you honor him through each sense. And then it stands for the five wounds of the Lord. And that's what you live for. And finally, it stands for the five joys of Our Lady. So, I'll just read you the passage. It's, a, it's the most beautiful one. As he's being given his shield, it just describes Sir Gawain. First, he was found faultless in his five senses. Everything is alliteration, by the way, in these poems. 
Next, his five fingers never failed the night. And all his trust on earth was in the five wounds which came to Christ on the cross, as the creed tells. And whenever the bold man was busy on the battlefield, through all other things, he thought on this, that his prowess all depended on the five pure joys that the Holy Queen of Heaven had of her child. Accordingly, the courteous knight had that queen's image etched on the inside of his armored shield so that when he beheld her, his courage would not fail. Now that's the image I want to leave with you, uh, leave with you at the moment. Is the shield, how does Our Lady accompany us? You've got the shield, the outside of the shield tells you what your life is about, okay? It's the purification of your senses, it's living and doing things for Christ, it's belief in his five wounds and the five joys of Mary, then inside the shield, which you can see, so that your courage does not fail, you have the image of Our Lady. So you go through life totally looking at the image of Our Lady as you walk. That is what holds you firm through every single part of your life and your ministry the image on the inside. And there's several things that this image really helps us to see then. The first is, Our Lady is there for protection, right? She's the inside of a shield. That's the first thing. The very oldest prayer to Our Lady, it's called the sub tuum presidium, under your protection. And presidium is the Latin word for a garrison. So Our Lady is like a garrison around us, protecting us. You know the prayer, don't you? We fly to thy protection, O Holy Mother of God. Despise not our prayers and our necessities, but deliver us from every danger, O ever glorious and blessed Virgin. Right? That's the subtuum presidium. It's the oldest prayer we have to Our Lady, and she is the defense. She's the protection She's the one you look at because you can rely on her always to protect you. That's the first point. Second point is, it's the importance of the image. And I think this is an important point maybe for us as catechists. Because often we need to teach somebody something. But there's another way you can help a person you're in ministry to and that is you show them something very beautiful. What you do is you refresh the spirit of the other person with beauty. His courage did not fail because he's looking at something incredibly beautiful. Now Our Lady, this is again one of her titles, is the all beautiful one. In the chapel where I used to work at Maryvale, in etched around the top above the altar was tota pulchra es Maria. All beautiful is Mary. She's called the beautiful gate, isn't she? It's one of her titles. All beautiful is Mary. It's a phrase that comes from St. Bridget of Sweden who when there was rioting in the streets talked about the beauty of Mary and quelled the riots. And that became a famous phrase from St. Bridget of Sweden in the medieval period. And it was amazing that we had Bridgetines who came to the chapel and lived and worshipped there, and they were so amazed to see their own foundresses saying on the top, but all beautiful is Maria. One of the stories, again, from the scriptures you might like to link to that is the the beggar sitting at the beautiful gate, because that is, think of that as the image of Our Lady. Where does the beggar sit? He sits at the beautiful gate, begging. Yeah. And remember what happens when Peter and John come along. They say, we have neither gold nor silver, but what we have we give you 
and they give them Jesus Christ and healing. The place where the healing takes place is the beautiful gate of Mary. That's where people go, they sit, they beg, and they can go into the temple. She's the beautiful gate we sit at. So she's not only the protectress, she's also the image of beauty. A third thing I think is really important as well is not only the image, it's as though Sir Gawain is going to look at his life through Mary. When he goes through his Christian life, he's going to be looking at her all the time. He's going to understand everything that happens to him in and through her. Does this make sense? Because that's what he's looking at. His Christian life is the other side of that. It's like a window, really, through which he looks. That's the idea of the consecration as well, right? We go to Jesus through Mary. He goes to the front of his shield through the image. He sees everything through her. That's why consecration is so important. So we've got this amazing sense then of this image of Our Lady we can hold on our shield who accompanies us through our life. Does that make sense to you? Okay, let's look at the word accompaniments now and just how that helps us understand Our Lady as well. So accompaniments. First point really is accompaniment is like a journey. So the idea of accompanying somebody, Mary went with haste, she's going somewhere, accompaniment is going to another place. So when we talk about accompanying people, and when we talk about Our Lady accompanying us, it's basically on a journey. Now I was raised on a place called Pilgrim's Lane. That was the name of the road I used to live on because it was the ancient road that led to Canterbury where there was the shrine of Thomas Becket. And so this is the road the ancient pilgrims would have walked on. If any of you know Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, all of the pilgrims were following the pilgrim's way. And that was the way, so we had a house on the way and it's a beautiful, the South Downs, which come all the way from London, all the way down to Canterbury to the shrine. And because of that, and I think because we lived there, my parents always used to teach us about the importance of the pilgrims and the pilgrimage there were, the pilgrims there were. And I just want to share with you something which is um, very close to me because my mother's, almost her favorite book was Pilgrim's Progress. And maybe it's partly because we lived on Pilgrim's Way And I don't know whether any of you have read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. You probably know of it. It's basically an allegory of the Christian life. And you have Pilgrim, who represents the Christian, and he's trying to progress to heaven, and he's on the pilgrimage, and he meets all sorts of different people during the pilgrimage who need to assist him. So again, this is a great image for us of accompaniment. It is basically a pilgrimage we're on and we're accompanying people on that pilgrimage. And my mother loved that so much that she decided, because she was a very organized woman, she decided for her funeral, and she died last year, for her funeral she would like a reading from the Pilgrim's Progress. And there were two figures in Pilgrim's Progress she particularly loved. One was called Mr. Standfast. Mr. Standfast was the person who, on your pilgrimage, made sure you never deviated from the way in terms of your faith. That's a very important accompanying kind of person. And the other person was called Mr. Valiant for Truth. And my mother loved Mr. Valiant for Truth. In other words, that's the other thing. She used to say to me, there were four lines of a poem. She would always say to me, even when she began to get mild dementia at the end of her life, she would always say to me, Remember, man with his burning soul has but an hour of life to build a ship of truth 
to sail the sea of death. Man with his burning soul has but an hour of life to build a ship of truth to sail the sea of death. And she would love saying that to me, Mr. Valiant for Truth. So she chose this passage, which we actually put on prayer cards for her funeral. And I want to mention this because these two figures are really important for how Mary accompanies us. Stand fast and valiant for truth. They're two of the key people who represent features of Our Lady. So this is, this is what valiant for truth says as he's dying. Then said he, I am going to my father's. And though with great difficulty I've got hither, yet now I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage. My courage and skill I give to him who can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles who will now be my rewarder. That's Mr. Valiant for truth. Then he goes down into the water and all the angels cheer on the other, as he comes out the other side. That is valiant for truth. With all his scars, he's come to the end. If you like, he's carried his shield. He's made it to the end. And Pilgrim has watched people like this. Pilgrim knows valiant for truth is how he should live. Pilgrim knows Mr. Standfast is crucial for his life. And the pilgrim needs those people. And of course, Our Lady is our Virgin Mary Standfast and valiant for truth more than anybody else. The church calls her the great pilgrim. So one of the titles for Mary, I'll just read you this, it's from the Second Vatican Council. This is from Lumen Gentium, document on the church, chapter eight. And that's what we really need to read to understand who Our Lady is for us. And it describes her there as the great pilgrim of faith. Thus the Blessed Virgin advanced in her pilgrimage of faith and faithfully persevered in her union with her son unto the cross, right? She's the great pilgrim who stays with him right to the end. Then he goes on. She now shines forth on earth, okay? Because she's now Mr. Valiant for truth out the other side. She now shines forth on earth until the day of the Lord shall come. A sign of certain hope and comfort to the pilgrim people of God. So Our Lady is the one who's, like Paul said, I fight the good fight, right? And I haven't yet reached the goal. Our Lady's reached the goal. So she now shines forth as the point of reference for us at the other side. One of the things, just to say about then, Mr. Valiant for Truth <clears throat> and Mr. Standfast, it's incredibly important if we're to help anybody move in life at all that we provide stability for moving. Nobody moves at all in a good direction without there being some stability to be able to move from. Yeah, so I'm just trying to remember, okay. The Great Commission, which we all know very well. The Great Commission, where Christ sends his people out, which is go, which is mission. How does that Great Commission end? It ends with, and lo, I am with you always until the end of time. In other words, Christ sends his mission, his disciples on mission, and they go, why? Because of the stability of his presence with them. 
So it's providing the presence for people, it's by being Mr. Standfast for them, that we give them as well the courage to move on. It's Our Lady managing to stay with us through our pilgrimage that enables us to move in the Christian life. It's not a matter of just moving with the person, it's a matter of staying faithful to what God wants for that person. It's valiant for truth and stand fast for the person so they can move. Once people have the goal clear, once they know where they're going, and once they have the stability of the presence with them, they can make a move, right? You can only move one foot if one is settled. You can't move unless something is stable, you can't take a step. And one of the things we do in accompaniment is we provide the stability so that the person can take the step. And the stability is ultimately the spiritual stability of truth, which we will never deviate from. If we ever deviate from the stability of truth, nobody can take the step because there's no sure footing to take the step from. You can only make that move, only move in hope when you're faithfully grounded. Yeah. That's what Mr. Stanfast, that's what Mr. Valiant for Truth, that's what they teach us, that's what Our Lady teaches us by being the faithful pilgrim unto the cross. That's what the Great Commission teaches us. Christ will be with us. That's why we go to the Eucharist. He will be with us always and never change from accompanying us. Neither will he ever change in himself. Right? Remember my squiggly line going across the island. He's with me. I follow the Eucharist and he will never leave my side. He will follow my squiggles, but he will not change. That is my stability. He will not change. He will be faithful. The book of Revelation describes him as the true and faithful one. Right? That's so important for any form of accompaniment. So that's the first meaning, if you like, the pilgrim side of accompaniment. Trying to help people move on the journey towards the goal. The second meaning of accompaniment I just want to, to pull out is in actually, it's in the word itself. And many of you will know this, but actually, lit, what does the word literally mean? Accompaniment. It literally means come with, pan is bread. Okay? With bread. It's the one who gives bread on the journey. Who gives bread on the journey? We know the answer, don't we? Okay, the living bread. Accompaniment is helping the living bread, Christ, to join us on the journey. Now this is important for our little phrase about Our Lady going as the visitation. When she runs to see Elizabeth with haste, and when she remains with her, who is Our Lady? at that point. Now Our Lady is, this is how she's described in that passage, she's actually described as the Ark of the Covenant. Now we know this for a number of reasons. And I, and I would recommend to you Brant Petrie's latest book, The Jewish Roots of, Our, of Mary, if you just want to read a few chapters on this. But when the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, at the Annunciation, the Greek word used is a very precise one, which is used for the Holy Spirit overshadowing the tabernacle in which there's the Ark of the Covenant. And when Mary goes with haste into the hill country to be with Elizabeth, that is exactly how it's described of the Ark of the Covenant going in the second book of Samuel, chapter 6 into the hill country. Now remember the Ark of the Covenant is that which accompanies the people in the Old Testament to be their protection. So the Ark of the Covenant, as long as God's Ark is with you in the Old Testament, you're protected. 
That's what they believed. The ark accompanied them into battle because of that. And Our Lady goes with haste into the hill country. Remaining for three months is another reference to how long the ark remained in the hill country. The baby leaping in the womb is exactly the same word as David dancing before the ark. And when Elizabeth says, how is it that the mother of my Lord should, should come to me? It's referencing David saying, how is it that the ark should come to me? So Our Lady is the Ark of the Covenant. So when we, we need to think about this, when Our Lady accompanies us in life and everybody, she does so as the Ark of the Covenant. So what's inside the Ark? What's the Ark for? In the Ark of the Covenant, as you probably know, we get it in the book of Hebrews, there's three things, isn't there? There's the tablets of the law, there's the staff of Aaron, the high priest, which is budded. And then there are the golden bowls containing the manna. So what, what does Mary bring with her? She's bringing the Eucharistic Christ with her. Jesus is the fulfillment of the priesthood, the high priest, obviously of the living bread and of the life which God gives us, which the, the Ten Commandments are about. He's the completion of the covenant. So Our Lady runs with haste to Elizabeth to bring her the living bread of Christ. That's what the ark is. Mary's role, if you like, is to make sure that we receive the bread of life. That is how she remains with us. That is her role entirely to bring us to her son who shares the bread of life with us. So the word remained, the word remained in that is a really important word as well. It's used again at the end of Luke's gospel. It's used at the beginning here. It's mino in Greek. It's used at the end. When the disciples asked Jesus on the road to Emmaus to stay with them, remain with us, for it is evening. And so Jesus, it says, Jesus went in and remained with them. It's the same word. We have Our Lady bringing the bread of life so that Jesus can remain with his disciples. Right? That's how Luke has constructed the whole thing. Isn't that amazing? That word remain is also used in John's gospel a lot, in John chapter 15. And again, this just helps us think how to accompany other people. John's chapter 15 is the, the true vine, where Jesus says, I am the true vine and you are the branches. Ten times in that passage, he uses the one word remain. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear fruit. If you do not remain in me, right? He continues, the key word in the whole of that passage is remain. And again, what this shows us and what Our Lady teaches us through all of this is that it's a kind of a principle you get in catechetics called the principle of double faithfulness. So the principle of double faithfulness is described in the general directory of catechesis as faithfulness to God and faithfulness to the human person. Whenever we catechize or wherever we're in ministry, it says you have to exercise a double faithfulness. Faithfulness to God and faithfulness to the human person. And they are not two equal things. There is a priority and an order in that. In other words, if you are faithful to God, you can practice faithfulness to the human person. We cannot be let loose in ministry without faithfulness to God. 
because we cannot be faithful then to the human person. There's a line in a poem called The Hound of Heaven by Francis Thompson, and it's the same line all over at the end of each stanza. All things betray you if you betray me. All things will betray you if you betray me. The only point of faithfulness we have to ensure is the faithfulness to God. Remain in me, abide in me, and that enables accompaniment, faithfulness to the other person. So we've got the idea of the two feet walking. We're enabling the other person to move forward, and that happens through faithfulness. So our lady is the model of all of this. That quotation I read you about Mary's faithfulness ends at the cross, doesn't it? We call her the starboard martyr, the one who stands. Yeah? The one who stands at the cross as well. I just want you to see the image behind me of the San Damiano cross because this is really important for understanding how Our Lady remains with us. As so often in these beautiful pieces of work, works of art, the artist has managed to pick up an incredible truth in the way that the cross is depicted. So you have Christ on the cross, and then, I hope the camera will pick it up in due course, there we are, thank you so much for that. You can see there, at the side of the cross, there's the beloved disciple, and there's Our Lady, the starboard martyr, the one standing and you can see possibly the blood of Christ dropping down on her head and the blood of Christ coming from the side, his side upon the beloved disciple. Now what's Mary doing standing at the cross? Because one of the things I had to really work on for this talk is working out for myself how I really understood this idea of faithfulness and standing and remaining. So it's not just something passive, it's something incredibly important that Our Lady has to do for us. What is Mary doing standing at the cross? Is my question. Well, first of all, she is standing there receiving Christ as her savior. The teaching of the Church on the Immaculate Conception is not that Mary, because she was immaculately conceived, was without a need for redemption. Mary was redeemed by her Son as much as you or I, and in fact, even more perfectly redeemed by her Son. Because her son saved her from every personal sin and original sin. He saved her so completely that the redemption he gave her was the most perfect redemption there could be. And Mary depends entirely upon her son for receiving her redemption. Now, we just have to think about this. I'm not a mother. It's very hard to watch anybody you love suffer. What's particularly challenging is when somebody is suffering for you. That becomes something incredibly difficult. Somebody whom you love now suffers because of you. And Mary had to receive Christ as the one who would suffer and die for her at that point. I can remember when one of our children at one point I found out was sleeping on the floor. And when I asked why he was sleeping on the floor, it was doing penance for me. When somebody, in other words, whom you really love, loves you so much that they suffer for you, that changes the heart. I don't know if any of you know the, the book Joe's Boys. 
Have any of you read that one? It's Little Women, Joe's Boys. Anyway, there's, there's a beautiful character in there, the professor, Professor Beer. He and Joe run this orphanage for children together. And the, he's a very loved person in the orphanage. The boys are boys and they're often disobedient. They're often bad. They often do things and they won't reform. And so he decided that whenever anybody did anything wrong, their punishment would be they had to beat him. So the boy, every time he did something, would come and beat the professor. And because they loved the professor, the boys reformed. Our Lady is not only standing by the cross, she's receiving, she is receiving the one she loves most and the one who loves her most. And she is receiving redemption for her. And what she's doing in the San Damiano cross also is she's not just standing there, she's pushing the beloved disciple against the figure of Christ. And you might like to come and see how that is so that the contour of the beloved disciple is actually right into Christ's side. So he is now molded by Christ's sacrifice. So what she does, in other words, is she is teaching us, because she learned this herself, when Mary accompanies us, She leads us faithfully to Christ. She's accompanying us to the cross so that we can receive redemption from him. And what she wants us to see, you can imagine Christ from the cross. Don't look at my pain, look at the love I'm showing. Don't look at my pain. You know what it's like when you really love someone? and you're, you're doing something for them, you're sacrificing for them, and it's painful, don't look at my pain, look at my love. And the mother is there who's receiving that love, receiving Christ as her savior, and helping us to stand at the cross and do that. You remember at the Last Supper, Jesus tries to help the disciples understand this is what they have to do. He tries to wash their feet. And you remember Peter? Lord, you will never wash my feet. And then Christ says, if I do not wash you, you have no part in me. I think one of the hardest things for us truly in the Christian life is you look at that figure and you ask him to be your savior. And you gaze on the look of love and not on the pain. And you learn to receive the redemption he longs to give. And who teaches us that most is Our Lady. Who teaches us that most in every situation? That's what it means to be the starboard martyr. The mother standing, not passively, standing to receive Christ's love in the fullest way, with a full awareness of the cost it is to him, but an even fuller awareness of the love which he has for each of us. That idea of standing then, that's when we stand with people, when we remain with them in accompaniment, when that's our role to stay with them, what are we doing? We are begging Our Lady to lean up against them and press them against the side of Christ so that they can receive him as their savior. Because he can save every person, he loves every person with an infinite love. And that's what we want. The idea of standing firm is, um, it's really illustrated, but there was only... The last time England got invaded was in 1066, right? Almost a thousand years ago. 
And the reason England got invaded was because they did not stand firm. The Saxons who were defending had a very classic form of defense. It was called the shield wall. So the way Saxons always defended themselves against anybody was, all of you lined up, you had a shield in front, you put another shield up here, you all stood behind it, and it was impregnable. Nobody could ever break through that. Remember Sir Gawain, right? You stand firm, Mr. Standfast. You stay with Christ. They were Christians. And when the Normans came and attacked the shield wall of the Saxons in 1066, they could not break it down. And it looked as though the Normans, the invading troops, would never conquer Britain. And then some of the Saxons decided the victory was theirs and they pursued the Normans down the hill and the shield wall broke and it was finished. Mr. Standfast moved on that day. And if, you, if we stay with Christ, with Our Lady, when Moses is at the Red Sea and all the Egyptians are galloping towards them, what does Moses say? Stand firm, do not move, and you will see the salvation of God. We have in ministry, we have to make a basic choice. Do we trust that God acts or don't we? Often our movement is because we no longer trust that he will do something, so we have to move and sort things out. The way Our Lady accompanies us is to say, remain close to my son. Never move from that. If you can do that for somebody, You've given them the faithfulness they need and all the ability to move themselves by being faithful to them. Do not leave the side of Christ. Keep the shield in front of you. Look at my image. Remain with my beauty. See everything through. Remember how I stood at the cross. You stand there for that person. Stand there at the cross interceding for that person begging Christ's mercy for them, but do not move. Do not run away, do not pursue things, do not break ranks. Remember my faithfulness and his. Now I want to leave you with um, one final thought. This is, I'm going to try and memorize it. Okay, this is a poem. I'm going to leave you with a final thought about a pilgrim. And I hope this is kind of a beautiful thing as well. <clears throat> it's a, a, a short poem by Yeats. Any of you? Oh, we've got some Irish here. W.B. Yeats. Thank you, Father. You probably know this poem. And it's basically about loving the pilgrim soul and being faithful to the pilgrim soul. Right. When you are old and gray and full of sleep, and Yeats wrote this to a woman he loved. When you are old and gray and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of fair grace and loved your beauty with a love false or true. But one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. Now what Yeats has given us in that beautiful love poem to the person he loves so much, just think of Our Lady the one who loves the sorrows of our changing face, the one who loves the pilgrim soul in us because she is such a pilgrim. Shall we just end in prayer to her, to this great pilgrim who accompanies us? Mary, we just want to thank you for this. 
We want to thank you for your accompaniment of us. We want to really thank you, Mary, for the way in which you love our pilgrim soul because you're the great pilgrim. And how you are the one who's stable in our lives. You're the one who gives us the protection of the shield. You're like a garrison around us, Mary. And above all, Mary, from the great love you have of your son, from that love which experienced the sorrow of the sword in your heart by the great pain, but also experienced even more the love he has for you and for each person so that you could become our mother and teach us this. Mary, we ask you to press us into the side of Christ. We ask you, Mary, be with us, stay with us, remain with us as that faithful witness and lead us to Christ, your Son, who is the bread of life. We ask all this, Mary, in the name of your Son, Jesus, our Lord. Amen.